Okay, so we are live on YouTube now. I'm going to go ahead and start the recording and we will get started. Thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar, How Trails Support Healthy Aging for All. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 211th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. Links for the closed captioning, the learning credit quiz, as well as the survey will be in the chat box. And attendees will receive a follow-up email from me within two days with a link to the recording, the transcript, the resources slide that will include the presenter emails, as well as learning credit details. And this webinar is free to the public thanks to a generous sponsorship from Maine Recreational Trails Program Advisory Committee. And a special thank you to our additional webinar partners today that include Camelot Trail, or I'm sorry, Camelot Tools, Doctors Elizabeth and Greg Berger, Poly Products, the Trails Safe Passing Plan, Stop, Speak, and Stand Back. Uh, Black Diamond Trail Designs, Presto Geosystems, the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, as well as the USDA Forest Service. So thank you to all those partners and sponsors. And I would like to introduce our uh, presenters for today. We have Allison Burson, who is the National Greenway Director with the East Coast Greenway Alliance. We also have Carol Kachadorian, who's the Executive Director with Double Tilde Corps. And we also have James Fuccioni, um, the director uh, with the Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative. So I, I'm excited to pass controls over to Allison to get started. Thank you, Candice. And um, thank you to all of our sponsors. I'm particularly excited to have um, you know, sponsorship from Maine because I'm sitting in Portland, Maine right now presenting. Um, and so I am the National Greenway Director of the East Coast Greenway Alliance, and we work to plan, design, advocate, and support partners to work on trail Maine to Florida. Um, and one of the key things we're working on is to make sure that trails are accessible to all. And I know for myself and my colleagues at our organization and everyone working on trails, the question of how can we learn more about what it means to make trails really inclusive and accessible is sort of an ongoing learning item for me. And all the way last February, I was really disappointed to miss hearing James give a presentation on trails and healthy aging. And I said to my colleagues, do you want me to get James to present um, to us? And they said, we've got a lot of other people we want to share with. So I came to Candace and American Trails and said, um, could we share this information with more? And not only was um, James able to present, but Carol as well. So I'm really excited to learn from both of them today about you know, a lot of considerations around trails and access for older adults on trails. And between the two of them, they'll share a lot about research around accessibility, both quantitative and qualitative research, assessment tools to measure age friendliness of trails, as well as policy considerations and resources for all of us. Um, and in terms of a little bit more about both their uh, expertise and knowledge, uh, Carol Cachadorian at Double Tilde Corps um, works at a nonprofit whose mission is to advance knowledge about planning for sustainable mobility and wellness. And Allison, to, could you yep. speak up just a little bit? Of Some course. People are having, thank you. Yeah, is thank this you. better, folks? Awesome. Much better. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So um, Double Tilde Corps, where Carol works, um, they work through community outreach, research, and education to encourage people to remain physically active through walking, bicycling, and transit as they age to uh, maintain wellness and a solid quality of life. And their work informs planners, engineers, public health professionals, advocates, policymakers, journalists, and more. Uh, Carol has a breadth of knowledge and expertise in translating planning and operations, working at both the city and regional levels, um, including school and community-based active transportation plans and older adult mobility. She understands the importance of both big data and personal experience to determine feasible changes to transportation systems that can make travel by all modes safe, accessible, and comfortable for all abilities. Uh, and Carol has spoken nationally and regionally on the need to revise long standing perception of older adults through words and images. 
She continues to conduct research on older adult mobility and wellness and partnering with several universities. Uh, James Fuccioni is the director of the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative, which is a statewide cross-sector network supporting and promoting inclusive age and dementia-friendly communities. And I know from my former work in Massachusetts, James is a go-to on all things how to make public spaces more accessible for older adults. His work is funded by the Point 32 Health Foundation, and they work to advance more than 200 age and dementia friendly communities, regional collaboratives and a state initiative led by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Jim serves on the Massachusetts Pedestrian Advisory Board and helps coordinate the Physical Infrastructure Work Group of the Massachusetts Advisory Council on Alzheimer's and Disease and All Other Dementias. Previously, James was Director of the Legislative and Public Affairs for the Home Care Alliance of Massachusetts and served as an aide in the State Senate. Before I turn it over to Carol to say more, I do want to say that the East Coast Greenway Alliance has a design guide that has a lot of basic information around considerations for accessible greenways and design. It's a nice foundational resource um, that we'll be providing an update on later this year. Um, and now I'm super excited now to hear Carol and James sort of dig in on what do these, what, what does it mean in detail? How can we make uh, trails more accessible for older adults? So thank you, Carol. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, and, and let's get started on, on what we've learned about trails and cycling and older adults. I can shift. Um, earlier this week, I saw this image uh, uh, announcing an op-ed on the New York Times about older adults and how um, difficult it is to walk within cities. Um, and, and unfortunately, this is a very gray image and it portrays an older adult as somebody who needs a cane and kind of hunched over um, compared to what we think of as not old. But through my work, uh, I've learned that chronological age and self age are very different and uh, older adults at cycle certainly demonstrate that. That really is the basic underlying, underlying assumption of my work. Um, I believe that People can and need to be physically active as they age. Cycling is an age-friendly way to, to remain physically active for the physical benefits, the psychological benefits, the social benefits. And trails are certainly a logical go-to place for older adult, adults. Unfortunately, cycling infrastructure doesn't, uh, and programs and policies don't always reflect the needs of older adults. Uh, and so my work is intended to help inform people that make those policies and programs and build, design and build the infrastructure and also to kind of push back against social pressure to encourage older adults to stop, stop cycling at a certain point. So I'm going to share with you what I've learned from the 50 plus cycling survey and journals. Um, as well as a little bit from work I did with some older adult communities. Um, along the way, I'll identify what's important. And then before I hand it off to James, we'll talk about um, how you can begin to use this information. The 50 plus cycling survey began out of a canceled interview that I had with an older woman. I met while cycling. We talked, we cycled and talked a bit, arranged to meet a few days later. I put together a list of questions, but she emailed me and said she was going to play golf instead. And so I thought, well, uh, let me let me launch a nationwide survey. Uh, so I did in December of 2017. There are three parts to it. Part one has a lot of detailed information. Part two is a visual preference survey. Um, and then there's an optional online journal. And I'm, I'm not going to share the visual preference survey with you today, but rather what I'm sharing is from parts one and the online journal. So the value of the survey is that it really is expanding our knowledge about physical activity and aging um, from the questions and the responses within the survey. And as I do the survey in multiple years, we, we've done year four now, I'm getting ready for year five, we can see some longitudinal changes with older adults. Uh, I also recommended in year three and found in year four that many people that took the survey used it as a self-assessment on how they can adapt their cycling habits so they can continue to cycle. Uh, and then the information helps inform planning, policy, and programs, um, sort of more particular to the 8 to 80 framework 
specifically for older adults. Uh, and this webinar is one way to do that. And lastly, frankly, older adults appreciate being asked. Um, so the survey this year is uh, the US and Canada. We expanded to North America. There were over 5,000 responses. About a, about a third are women, two thirds are men. And you can see from the chart on the right that we had a lot of responses in the 55 to 75 range. Although we did connect with an octogenarian cycling group and got uh, responses from a lot of older, older, older adults. Um, I, I, I have a short amount of time and it's hard to know what to share with you, but I will say that the data in the survey really provides a, a coat of many colors. Uh, we have people that cycle once a month to daily. They cycle in many different um, infrastructure contexts in many different urban and land development contexts, um, climates. Many cycle into their late 80s and 90s. Um, they cycle to be social, they cycle to work, they cycle to be physically uh, fit. And even when they have crashes, sometimes they stop for a while, but oftentimes it inspires them to keep on cycling, recover and keep on cycling. So I'm going to start with the end in mind. We ask uh, people, if they could envision a time when they would not cycle, and if you can, if you can look at this black line, these these are the people that said, "I cannot envision a time when I would not cycle," and that's about twenty three percent of the people. Um, but the two highest uh, scoring, uh, most often mentioned reasons for not cycling related to health and safety which as you can see, increases as people get older. And the cycling environment, which interestingly goes down as people age, and that may be because they're using safer, more comfortable facilities. Uh, and so we also ask people um, who are currently cycling, what factors affect where they cycle? And you can see there, there are again, four categories of reasons. And note that the cycling environment and health and safety are the, the ones that most influence where people cycle. So you're gonna see this theme throughout and it's, it's, a, it's a reason to focus on that, build good infrastructure and programs to, um, that are healthy and safe for older adults. Another question in the part one of the survey is if the amount of cycling they did in the past year changed. It could be because of age, it could be because of change in circumstances, because they moved some other reason. 46% said they, they had a change in cycling. Um, some of those cycled less, and you can see the reason is health and safety and cycling environment are our, our friends there. Um, people who cycled more, um, the, the most common reason was for personal lifestyle, that commitment to cycling, the benefit that it provides to them, but then health and safety and the cycling environment were the next two highest uh, rating reasons for cycling more. So we're back to those two factors. The elephant, the elephant in the room kind of is crashes. We hear all the time, crashes and falls, that older adults have a higher than normal rate of crashes and falls as cyclists and pedestrians. So I uh, coded over 800 fall descriptions um, from the, the part one of the survey and grouped them into six categories, as you can see listed at the bottom of the, of the sheet here. And I'm gonna talk about three of these categories because they may have the, the they may be most relevant to the aging process. Um, surface conditions, operator error, and skill level or aging. So some of the most common reasons uh, for a fall or a crash related to surface conditions are um, the condition of the pathway, gravel, sand, potholes, um, the, the capacity of the bikeway, particularly trails, narrow passages, sharp turns, offset pathways, uh, steep trail access, limiting features such as um, lighting and sight lines. So the question is, did this cause a fall because of the design and the maintenance? Did, it, did the younger cyclists do a better job of navigating those challenges? Um, not sure, but if you take a look at that in comparison with operator error and error and age-related limitations that people cited for falls, um, they talk about inattention, poor decision-making, going too fast for conditions or riding above my skill level, um, trouble stopping and starting, not starring, but stopping, 
And then some people said they just don't know. And there was a lot of self-deprecation, you know, my fault, I'm stupid, I'm clumsy. Don't know if that's age related. Uh, and we haven't done um, we haven't done a survey of people under 50 to know if, if they have the same reactions. Some people specifically said um, my fall was age related due to a health issue. I don't have the strength or agility. Um, I get tired more easily um, and the effect of aging. So how can we understand this in order to do a better job of having programs? James going to talk about some and designing better cycling facilities. So now I'm going to share with you some information from um, the 845 online journal entries that we received for year four. Again, about a third women, two thirds men, and you can see the age group for those that provided journal entries. Um, we, the, journal, the journal form asked them to, to identify the facilities that they biked on, it, it offered these and asked them to do cycle here. And the reason why probably roads and streets have such a higher percentage is, as you can see from the map that somebody loaded, um, uploaded that took the, that completed the journal, it's oftentimes a mix of on road and trails and other facilities and sidewalks. But note that trail away from the road and trail next to the road were um, kind of in the middle in terms of use. The good news is we asked people to rate the safety and comfort of those facilities and trails, whether it's away from the road or next to the road, receive the highest uh, score, safety and comfort score on one to, a scale of one to five. Uh, so that means that those are really valuable, and that's really valuable infrastructure for older adults. We asked what worked well, um, many people said it was the trails, planning a bike bike ride that has a trail, riding with friends, um, having a bike rack. And so, uh, yay, trails. We know that trails have a lot of value for everyone, including older adults. And there were a lot of comments on nature. Uh, and I'm, I'm beginning to unpack how nature affects cycling and mental health and joy in life. Uh, and these are some of the things that people said about nature. Um, they, they, they either identified a trail that was built in a nature setting, such as along a river or in the forest, or the fact that the presence of the trail that they cycled on allowed them to enjoy the day, the sun, the air, hearing the birds. So, day trails. Sadly, we asked what didn't work and what they didn't use despite safety concerns. Um, trail access is a big one. Um, much of the trail access is from street and, and highway grid especially at intersections. And sometimes that access is steep and not comfortable. And as people age, uh, navigating those, um, that, that difficult access uh, is not great. And it may, it may cause some falls. And it did cause some falls in the, in the fall data. Um, there are also gaps in trails that people uh, used and ended up cycling on the road. Um, and uncomfortable situations, they, they didn't find another route that was comfortable. So they, they um, figured out a way to, to, to get around that gap by cycling on the road. Trail conditions was another uh, thing that was uh, they cycled on that was uncomfortable. One on Beers Mill Road near me is, it's nice to have that trail, but it's directly next to the road. It has a very limited capacity with those bumper guards. Um, and somebody noted that, as well as um, somebody said a bumpy path they used, but it wasn't, it wasn't especially comfortable. Isolation was something that somebody else pointed out. And trails are often built in areas where there isn't a lot of adjacent development or people. And so the question is, are there safety features of that trail, such as these markings on a trail, um, the Ohio Lumpkin Trail, uh, where if you get into a problem, you can um, specify where you are. We asked what people avoided, and you might, you might guess gaps, trail gaps. They just chose a different route. Um, they avoided uncomfortable trail conditions, um, unsafe trail options, and uh, sometimes people drove to ride instead of cycling to ride. But people have some positive things to say, including this one, that um, after so many years of cycling, I'm grateful to still be able to do this. Now, I'm going to share a little bit for information on trails and trail access from a project I did in uh, on 10 older adult communities in California. Uh, we looked at active living as well as tiered living communities 
and tiered as in they had independent living, assisted living and nursing or memory care within the facilities. Um, mix of housing types, whether it was an apartment, um, duplexes, uh, cottages, individual homes, and a variety of income race, rate um, ranges. So I'm gonna share three communities with you. The first one is Encino Royale in Goleta. It was developed in the 1960s, so it has kind of a suburban pattern to it. It attracted residents who want to be close to destinations, nearby grocery stores and other destinations. They want to be able to walk or cycle to them. Uh, trails are a couple of miles away, and, uh, as you, and there was not great access to them. But thanks to resident advocacy, there was one resident that, that helped form an advocacy group. The town um, did a bicycle and a pedestrian master plan in 2018. And as you can see, proposed some um, new bikeways. They, they actually had a workshop um, specific, specifically for um, Encino Royale, which was great. Traditions at River Oaks was developed as newer, developed in the early 2000s, uh, specifically for high-end buyers. And it's here, it's really far away from town. Um, it doesn't, it has a lot of on-site active mobility infrastructure, what I call AMI. People tend to stay on the site to, to, to walk and to bike. But there are a number of people that want to get to this river trail here. And this is this this is what it looks like: narrow roads, a lot of topography. Uh, the town, the city, when they did the master plan, did not take into consideration the older adult community in their work. Um, but miraculously, they did propose a, a class one bikeway that would connect residents to the trail. In the same town, we spoke with the um, public housing executive director. He found this wonderful uh, piece of land. He's um, it's near grocery stores and transit. He's going to um, planning to build an apartment, a low income apartment building that satisfies the county's needs for low income housing. And um, it is right along that river trail walk. In fact, it's going to be called River Walk Terrace, and there'll be a connection to the trail. Um, and some uh, the site plan calls for some bike parking. So hopefully both of those things will happen and residents will use that trail. Um, I met a woman who's 87 and bikes every week. And um, the community she lives in has some, she has about a three and a half in terms of the quality of the bike network for her. She says, and keeps this in mind, the older I get, the more I need safer and more comfortable circumstances to cycle. So you can see from the work that we've done on the cycling survey and the journal and older adult community that learning about cycling habits really helps us think about how to make cycling facilities uh, more usable and safer for older adults, as well as policies and programs to help them continue to cycle. I'm going to hand it off to James, and I'm going to, as I do so, I'm going to ask you to think about four things as he's presenting. First, where does your work fit into the outcome of mobility and wellness for older adults? Do you use an interdisciplinary approach? Are you inclusive to be sure to include older adults and people's disabilities in a meaningful way? And are you open to changing design guidelines and standards so that it responds to what older adults say they need rather than build it um, in a different way and expect older adults to figure out how to use it, even though it may not be ideal. So thank you. And I'll um, turn, turn the mic over to James. Thank you very much, Carol. I appreciate the, the segue slide. It wouldn't be a webinar unless my computer froze up a little bit. So I'm going to share. My screen with folks and hopefully. This is working for everybody. Um, I think I may need to switch this up. I'm sorry. Um, all right. We get a, th a thumbs up, Carol. Is this the right format here? Can you see the, is this okay? All right, great. So thank you again, Candace, for having me. Thank you, Allison, for connecting the dots to get me to present alongside Carol uh, with her amazing data and uh, conversations with older adults. If anybody gets a chance to work with Allison, please take the opportunity. She's amazing. Um, just a little bit about the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative. Um, as, as Allison explained, we are 
uh, a statewide cross-sector network. We involve, um, we incorporate state government, uh, philanthropy, community-based organizations, local government, uh, and all kinds of different partners in regional and local planning to support aging dementia-friendly communities. Um, the My favorite way that we've been described is um, rather than a think tank, we were a do tank, and we we help communities take action to, to support healthy aging for all. Um, and just a little bit about what the age-friendly movement is, is is all about it it started with the world health organization around 2005 2006 um kind of noticing and, and taking action with uh, demographic demographic shifts and you can just see some of the highlights um of what age-friendly environments are which are as you might imagine accessible equitable inclusive safe and secure and supportive and recognizing that older people play a crucial role uh in their community so if you're this is an international movement um, but in the United States, AARP uh, manages a lot of the age-friendly work. Depending on where you are in the country, it could be it could be age-friendly and dementia-friendly. It could be a master plan for aging. I know that California and some other states have um, uh, this broad master plan for aging, which is the same thing with a different name. Um, but there are about uh, uh, seven to eight hundred communities that are recognized by AARP and the World Health Organization across the country. Uh, this is our our framework that we operate off of. Uh, so, you know, the the surveys and listening sessions and all the assessment uh, that goes on and the engagement of older adults in community uh, sort of usually goes into these frequent flyer topics. And you can see outdoor spaces and buildings sort of on the left hand side that incorporates trails directly. But there's lots of crossover with some of the other focus areas. Um, and this is all just a menu of options. The only requirement of this movement is that you ask older adults what being age and dementia friendly means to you and, and how that can be improved in your community. There's opportunities and strengths of any community, county, region uh, that support healthy aging. So we help connect the dots on the things that are working and amplify those those strengths and uh, try to address the things that um, has maybe go unnoticed or could or could use some support. Um, so since age and dementia friendly communities were uh, two separate movements in a lot of the country, they are uh, kind of running parallel and apart. Um, we and a couple other states like Connecticut and some others have have combined in a line of the age and dementia friendly movement. Uh, mass.gov, our state website, our executive office of elder affairs hosts um, what we jokingly call the toolkit to end all toolkits because there's so many resources that support this work. Um, we funnel a lot of them here. So if you are interested in becoming age friendly, dementia friendly, or both, um, a lot of the stuff that can support your work is is on this web page. This is available to to anybody. And there's you can see I, I called out the outdoor spaces and buildings focus area. Uh, and there's there's a lot of good stuff in there that um, that you can access. Just to give folks an idea of how this is working in our state, um, there are now 230 communities working to be uh, age and or dementia friendly. Um, there are regional approaches to this work in 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 Massachusetts. Everything's local. We have 351 cities and towns often liking to do things and preferring to do things their own way. Uh, but we've been able to uh, leverage some uh, collaboration uh, across regions and, and counties um, that that have brought communities together to pool resources and and address problems uh, collaboratively, which has been which has been great to to be a part of and see. Um, on our website, we are fortunate to have um, the foundation that supports our work, the Point 32 Health Foundation also supports uh, the Gerontology Institute at UMass Boston. So you can go to our website if you're in Massachusetts uh, and they support this work in the other states they operate in. So um, other New England states have this as well. Uh, but you can go to our website. There's a drop down menu of every city and town. And then you uh, kind of have about 180 demographic and health and wellness indicators um, that you know can inform and start the conversation about becoming more age and dementia friendly. And what I pulled out from these are wellness and prevention uh, indicators. And those are also available if 
you can get through enough clicks. Uh, I put the link below on the bottom right hand corner. They're available through the uh, the CDC, and that may be uh, informative to your work as well. So just wanted to call that out as a widely available uh, resource. Um, building off of what Carol was talking about, I just wanted to call out some data from the League of American Bicyclists that say that older adults have some of the highest rates of biking and walking uh, for exercise. And you can see 48% of people age 50 and older who took any walking trips take three or more walking trips for exercise each week compared to 38% of people 49 years and younger. Um, so just you know, there's, there's there's lots of data. This can change locally, obviously, but as broadly speaking, uh, as a demographic group, older adults, um, and especially since the pandemic, are walking and biking more uh, than uh, than other age groups comparatively. Uh, one of my one of my more favorite things to show is uh, <laughs> the people walker. You've heard of dog walking. Well, in LA, there's a people walker that this article says LA's people walker is beating loneliness one step at a time. This is just to illustrate the fact that trails, walking, bicycling, this is all a social opportunity as well as a physical activity opportunity. Um, and folks may have seen Surgeon General's um, massive report on loneliness and social isolation in the United States, no matter what age you are, it, it's an all ages issue. Um, and trails can be one way of addressing uh, uh, addressing that. And I'll talk about activation of trails uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment. Um, so this is just one of our um, more progressive um, age and dementia-friendly initiatives in the state. Age-friendly uh, Boston, age and dementia-friendly Boston has a map of age-friendly walks and those are at um, spaces because they're age friendly because the city of Boston plows them in the winter. It's important in this part of the country. The paths are also smooth, free of stairs and parking is nearby. Uh, and for those older adults looking for a little bit more of a challenge, there's also Hike Boston. Um, and the majority of the participants in, in, in those programs are older adults themselves. Um, so between Hike Boston and age-friendly walking, there's plenty of opportunities to get outside, even in the city of Boston, to walk around. Um, there's even uh, assisted living facilities that have um, outdoor walking paths that they've made available uh, to the public. That's on this map as well, but we have you know, those partners in other parts of the state. And they've even, um, if people want them, they will loan out um, you know, a device that if you experience a fall, you can uh, call uh, an emergency responder and 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 uh, you'll be able to get um, some help. But uh, just to address the fall is part of what Carol was talking about. Um, we have, uh, we're also lucky to have another partner uh, called Walk Massachusetts. They have come up with uh, some age-friendly walking infrastructure improvements. So you see some of those here, improving lighting. And, and again, you heard this in Carol's presentation. Um, but uh, publicly accessible toilets, making the trails accessible themselves, um, bus and transit stops, making those accessible. We also uh, have an age and dementia friendly uh, transit stop or, or, or bus resource that's available on our website. Um, although this, this icon doesn't reflect it, benches should have backs and arms to help older adults get up and down. Um, and all kinds of other uh, considerations on this on this slide that we encourage communities um, communities to adopt and take on. Uh, there's also age friendly policies and practices that uh, were developed alongside Walk Massachusetts, um, and those are, for the most part, some of them are generally obvious, including uh, older adults and municipal and and uh, regional infrastructure planning, um, establishing partnerships and. and talking about zoning and the infrastructure around senior housing and councils on aging senior centers. Um, uh, si again, sidewalk, uh, snow shoveling and, and snow clearing, snow and ice um, removal and, and, and mitigation and that kind of thing. Talking about slow zones, um, walk audits is a thing we do a lot and there's no, there's nothing keeping that away from trails. We could do walk audits of of um of trails as well and that would be a great way to see kind of where your 
trails in your region or area stand. Um, and more recently, Allison uh, queued this up in her introduction as well, um, but there is a, a statewide uh, advisory council on Alzheimer's disease and all other dementias. Um, to our pleasant surprise, they named uh, a physical infrastructure work group to talk about this mounting research that shows that um, you know the built environment impacts mental health, and I think we're all aware of that. But it al also can uh, impact um, you know uh, dementia, but also be accommodating to people living with dementia and especially their caregivers to be able to get outside uh, and to have some uh, physical activity uh, and some other social engagement again. But you'll see. Uh, in this, we talk about safety, wayfinding, uh, and just other design considerations. There's no specific design guidelines, but it's more of things to consider. Like you can see on this bottom right-hand graphic, the fact that signage uh, to be dementia-friendly should have icons as well as text, because some people living with dementia may recognize text, not icons, icons, but not text. Um, it also helps with people speaking other languages as well, so it is more inclusive but it it's just helpful to identify um you know entrances and exits uh, stairs and trash cans bathrooms all kinds of things that um that you'd want to call out um to dive a little more deeply into the uh age and dementia friendly trails considerations from the dementia friendly perspective um you know access that was talked about a lot through carol's presentation um, but wayfinding signage to find access points, uh, transit, uh, you know, being available to transit, having touch points, parking ramps, safe pedestrian crossings. Um, again, we talk a lot about benches with backs and arms placed along the trail. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a more extreme example, but you may have seen in the news that there was a 93 year old that um, did um, a half dome in Yosemite and um, he trained using the stairs in his assisted living facility. So just to make the tie in back to this presentation, if you place benches along trails that can help older adults set goals for physical activity and have longer walks uh, along the trail alongside, you know, other older adults, uh, alongside caregivers and that kind of thing, wayfinding along the trail, um, you know, is the trail uh, accessible and suitable for wheelchair and mobility devices? I know that's not always the case, but if it is, that helps to improve uh, for a whole other population. Uh, and then activation, I talked about this, or I teased it with uh, the LA People Walker, but we have a lot of walking clubs and bicycle groups in Massachusetts. Um, guided nature history walks, there's plenty of history in, in Massachusetts, but that's a way to um, get people out and show people the trails, uh, community events, um, art installations. We have a very strong arts and cultural uh, community in Massachusetts that's always sort of uh, presenting these funding opportunities for different things. And that's a way to activate trails, bike sharing, things that I'm sure folks in this call know all about. But there's lots of ways to connect the dots between community and, and trails. Uh, and get older adults and people of all ages uh, involved and out um, to just out in nature and to, to be physically more physically active. And then just finally, I wanted to show that Mass Daughter State Department of Transportation uh, has set up this great map of uh, the Purdy Trails Network. So you can see, depending on where you are in the state, um, where there are bike lanes, shared use paths, um, uh, bicycle, pedestrian priority roadways, um, all kinds of things that are planned under construction or already exist in the state. And you can sort of see, I don't know if folks can see this, but um, where they connect with uh, trails in other states. So you are not, it's not like you're hitting an invisible wall at the border. A lot of these trails extend into other states as well. So there's plenty of room for collaboration within your state, across communities, across state lines. Um, and there will likely be partners that you have uh, that can help you um, activate these trails for, for older adults, people living with dementia, and their caregivers. Um, and so here's my contact information and our supporters, and I'm going to stop sharing mm -hmm. and turn it back to Candace. So hopefully I've made the lightning round work.
Uh, but thanks again for having me. Thank you so much, James. And of course, thanks to Carol. I know you guys went over a lot of information in a short period of time. So um, attendees, um, just to let you all know, of course, there we have the presenter emails noted on this slide. I will also include their contact info in my follow-up email. So if any additional questions come up, please feel free to reach out to them. And we are gonna go into live Q&A for the remaining 20 minutes. Um, and I encourage you, if you still have questions, please feel free to send them. Um, and I'll try to answer as many as I can during the live webinar. Um, the first question, let's see here. The first question I'd like to ask is from Carol. Uh, I am interested in the issue of class one e-bike, you know, pedal assist prohibit, uh, prohibitions on um, many trails. This can severely affect access for older adults as they begin to experience diminished strength and cardio capacity. Is this something that is being discussed at some point in your organizations? Um, so maybe, Carol, I'll start with you if you have some sure. insight on that. Sure, I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, there is information in the... Uh... In the um, in the from the year four survey that's going to be in the data book that'll be published in about a month on e-bikes and people either love them. Um, we had some unkind things that uh, some of the respondents said about people that ride e-bikes, even older adults that ride e-bikes. And I have um, I had had a conversation with the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission that is looking at e-bikes as a consumer product, including. Um, the different levels of, of e-bikes in terms of their, their, their speed, their capacity. Um, I will say that e-bikes on trails is an issue. It could certainly be an issue on class one bikeways. And I could certainly make the comment, the, the information we got from people in the survey about how unsafe they are with with people riding normal set of, normal pedal bikes available to contribute to the conversation. So um, there's a discussion in the data book that will be published in my data book in about a year. And I have been working with the US product, um, Consumer Product Safety Commission. I know the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals uh, has also revised its policy on e-bikes and address, addresses this. So there are, there are different places to be part of that conversation. Um, Great, yeah. I'll add mm -hmm. to that question. You know, some of the questions, is this something your organization addresses? So East Coast Greenway Alliance is working with um, trail managers, so state agencies and municipalities up and down the whole East Coast, as well as a number of trail advocacy groups. And yes, every single group we're working with is thinking hard about what makes sense for e-bikes and there's sort of two huge considerations I want to just sort of, sort of remind us all of of one that class one e-bikes which are ones that they only have the sort of motor support when someone is pedaling and their captain can't go above 20 miles per hour those can really help extend access for health reasons um, as people are aging or if they're injuries um, so we we do see all up and down the East Coast and across the country, e-bikes are expanding who has access to cycling. At the same time, we are hearing from trail managers as well as trail users, and especially from older trail users, that e-bikes moving really quickly on trails, especially on crowded trails, can create really complicated trail conditions and make it a lot, trails feel a lot less accessible. Um, and it's really important in terms of figuring out, especially on unpaved trails and narrower trails, rather than your sort of 14 foot wide, you know, rail trail, um, really important to consider what the context is and sort of what each local environment can support in terms of wear and tear and use. We right. could probably have a whole webinar on e bikes and trails and, um, yeah, I, I think there's what I call the startle effect when you're biking on a normal pedal bike and somebody passes you rapidly on an e-bike. As an older adult, I, I experience that startle effect and it can be unsettling. So, mm -hmm. And American Trails, we're actually hosting a webinar on electric assisted devices in December. So if that's of interest, and of course, we'll probably be hosting more too. Um, I don't know if James, do you have any um, comments on the e-bikes? Um, 
with your organization? No, I'm going to stay out of the okay. e-bike discussion, okay. but Carol and Allison, I think, got it right. So nothing to add. No notes. Great. Can I just say one more thing? I think it's mm -hmm. really, really important that as you age, if you feel that you need to adjust what you expect out of biking and the bike that you use, that you give thought to the right bike. I am absolutely against saying, oh, you're older than an e-bike. People have strength issues, have balance issues, and there are a lot of single, single vehicle e-bike crashes with older adults because older adults, it's not the right bike for that person. If it is the right bike, great. But I think it's important to really get the right bike, not an e-bike per se. And that's my mantra. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> All right. All right, Carol, you talked me into it. So as part of this movement that we promote, it's it's communities of support. And within an age-friendly community, you can also have age-friendly businesses. So if you have bike shops, it's important to have bike shops know about ageism, as Carol sort of mentioned, but also make sure that the bike fits the person has you know safety run throughs knows how to use it and that's really the important thing not dismissing anybody because of their age or who they are but helping somebody access you know, an opportunity to do something um is sort of what we try to promote if it's there so so backing up carol <laughs> thank you all for that um let's see a question from uh, from tim what are some best practice references or resources for bench spacing frequency? James, you know, you had mentioned the provisions of benches as a way to promote greater inclusivity and accessibility, even as a way to help older adults increase their capacity for other and more ambitious physical activity. I mean, it, it it's about context of the trail. And if you have interesting uh, viewpoints or vantage points that you want to put benches at. Um, there's no best practice spacing. Um, but if it's almost more about promotion, if folks know that there are benches with backs and arms along the trail and there are, there are dots being connected in the community about that, then people know that there's an opportunity to use a trail where they'll have an opportunity to rest and turn around to the trail access point or go further. Um, so we haven't heard from any of our partners about distance. Allison, you may have a comment about that, but um, as long as they are there <laughs> every so often, I think it helps, but that's maybe a little general. And I'll add that sort of no rule of thumb for exactly X spacing, but so important to consider bench placement around can somebody get to it from the trail? Is it in a spot that's where, where somebody can comfortably sit or is it too sunny or right at the trailhead, which could be great, but then there's no other rest points out along the trail. So really try to think about and get as much information about what, what users need as opposed to sometimes somebody can get really focused on they wanna donate a bench or they, you know, think this is just the right place, but don't realize the accessibility considerations um, beyond sort of their own personal idea about it. Yep. And the person who asked that is going to set the best practice. After this webinar, we're going to put the benches certain a certain number of yards apart, and we're going to know for everybody else. <laughs> if I could just add to that, we were in Sun Valley in, in August a few years ago, and there's a really great trail there, but it, there's no shade. It was terribly hot. And I kept looking for a bench. And, and I think, you know, the, there are not enough benches if you can't see one e easily. And then there was a bench and it wasn't in the shade and it wasn't near the drinking fountain and it wasn't near a place to park a bike. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we, we've seen trails every like with benches every quarter of a mile and we've seen trails with no benches. So it's better to have them than not yeah. you know, as often as mm -hmm. possible without being ridiculous, but yeah. <laughs> Great, all right. Another question for you, James, from Ben. Um, do the bike lanes indicated in the MassDOT map distinguish between low and high stress bike lanes? Very important for aging riders. 
I can answer. <laughs> oh, I can you answer. go ahead. It doesn't distinguish between high and low stress bike lanes. It may distinguish between protected and unprotected. And I do want to say that what's so amazing about this is MassDOT has included in their trail network maps and for the trail for the whole state, they included the protected bike lanes and bike lanes in that because they understand and want people to be able to see that connecting to the trails and getting to the trails comfortably and safely is part of the trail system network and accessibility. Um, and we see you know, MassDOT is just a leader. You know, one of the wonderful things East Coast Greenway is working with DOTs up and down the whole East Coast. We're just so impressed with MassDOT's work there and have been sharing this and hope, you know, other states will look at this and you know start thinking about including the trail and connection to trail accessibility in their mapping. Great. Thank you, Allison. A mm -hmm. uh, uh, question for Carol from Rachel. Your extensive uh, outreach to older adults is very impressive. Which responses or conclusions from your research surprised you the most? And if applicable, how can trail planners adjust their strategies and process to best meet the needs of older adults? Yeah, the things that surprised me the most were, um, I guess, the people that rode despite uh, despite the unsafe, unsafe and uncomfortable trail access and trail gaps. Um, I had a photo of the trail in in Key West, the Overland uh, Heritage Trail, or whatever it's called, and we got to that big gap. My husband and I did, and we went, "We're not going any farther." Um, but what was the second part of the question? Because I know I can answer that. It's a senior <laughs> moment here. Um, um, it, sure, let me pull it up here again. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. How can the trail planners adjust their strategy yeah. and process to best meet the needs of older yeah. adults? So I was thinking about that for the, for the Veers Mill Trail, where the person said that it's right next to the road and the capacity is limited. And I was thinking about you know I, that trail is needed because it's a major it's a major recreation and transportation route but honestly i don't know how they figured i don't know if they asked a group of people you know they kind of laid it out temporarily and asked a group of people to cycle on it people from all ages did they do it during you know like commuting for work did they do it on busy weekends did they get like 20 people in a short distance going in two directions trying to figure out if it was the right width and the right placement, and, and maybe there were no other choices. But I think being very careful about including and testing and getting feedback is makes the most sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I have I am contractually obligated to mention a TED talk on ageism that Carol, you know, you you said it's a senior moment, but the TED Talk says when a teenager learns how to drive, loses their keys, nobody calls it a junior moment. So people have only <laughs> brain freezes. So there we go. Yeah, there have been some wonderful TED Talks on, on ageism, but yeah, we're not going to, on aging, we're not going to. Yeah. yeah, aging, sorry. Aging, aging. <laughs> Oh, uh, Patrick has a question. This is kind of posed to everyone. If you are aware of any um, nationwide grants available to help implement trail improvements that could enhance the experience for the 55 plus community. So we put something on our website a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the National League of Cities has this really extensive infrastructure funding database uh, from the, the federal infrastructure uh, law. So um, I think you can Google that and I can dig it up, dig up the link off our website, but that's probably the closest nationwide thing I know about where you can search all kinds of different opportunities. Uh, so I'll just put in a plug. America Walks has their community change grant application open right now through October 9th. And those are for small grants for community yeah. members to make a change uh, where they live to make their neighborhood more walkable. Um, so that one coming up really soon. So I want to make sure people know about it. And that's that's a fifteen hundred dollar grant. So it needs to be like small and really solve kind of a, a community identified need, I would think. And I don't know whether I have to, I will take a look at the NLC um, database. I don't know whether they have DOT funding as well as, you know, rec trails funding, um, because sometimes you need both of those in order to 
make a whole cloth out of it. Mm -hmm. um, Margarita is asking, I believe this is for Carol, um, have you found more responses if you pose the need as adaptability, um, helping everyone because you never know when you might need better facilities? No. Um, we focused on um, the words, you know, I, I was I was calling people cyclists and somebody said to me, yeah, a lot of people don't think of themselves as a cyclist, so you need to change it to people who, who cycle. Um, and it, it, that, would, that would be something to add to our promotion for year five. Um, we did get a lot of responses of people who adapted their bikes. Um, adapted how they cycle, whether they're they're a tandem rider now because their their partner can't because they need to they need to support by riding the tandem or they have a step through bike because they can't have a top tube. Um, so adaptability is included in the responses, but we might get more a richer data set if we if we ask the question that way. Mm -hmm. Thank I you. I know that for me both James and Carol's presentations really made me think about as they're talking about best practices for accessibility for older adults. So many of the things they're suggesting would lead to more comfortable experiences for everyone. You know, we had a question um, just now um, about is it helpful to people if maps can show where there are amenities such as bathrooms or benches or accessible yeah. parking spots. And, for many people who might be nervous that they won't find the accommodations they need on a trail, you know, the, the more information or the more trails designed to accommodate many people, sort of the, the safer and happier hopefully everyone will be. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, great. A question from Julia. Um, do you have any data or thoughts on the presence of emergency blue phones along trails and if that helps drive trail use? I don't have any, and I don't often see emergency blue phones. And, and I also don't often see the kind of markings of the photo I showed that's on the Ohio Lumpkin River Trail. Um, I, I have shared that, that photograph with um, other folks that are asking that question. And um, when I've done trail planning, I always include those recommendations because some people are, are concerned about safety on trails. And, and um, that provides a level of comfort to use them, so. And and I mentioned there's just uh, like one assisted living facility that has its trail opened up for the community that that loans that will loan out a personal uh, alert, emergency alert device if, if folks want one for just the security of it or if something actually happens, but um, that's the closest thing we know about. I suspect, you know, the answer might be, well, you know, people have cell phones. Not everybody does and not every place has good coverage. And, you know, as luck would have it, you're going to have an issue in a place where there isn't good cell coverage. And then no way to, if even if you do, no way to indicate to the person you're calling where you are. So. And it's and for, for older people, I think it, it, it speaks to, you know, again, the social element of doing this along with somebody else. Yeah. I think that for social and safety reasons, there's, yeah. there's plenty of reason to do that. And people that answered, responded to the survey, nearly all of them said they, they feel comfortable cycling alone, but the value of cycling with somebody else is, is in emergencies and it's kind of safety in numbers to be more visible if they're cycling on the road. So, yeah. Great. Okay. We'll ask one more question before we end it. Um, where is it here? Um, oh, Ryan is asking, um, many of our off-road bikeways are faced with homeless camps. Has there been any studies about the perception of safety in situations like this? Yeah, I actually removed from the presentation some comments that um, I think it was a woman in her 70s made about feeling uncomfortable biking on a trail where there are homeless encampments and wanting to cycle with other people. So, um, and that was that was in the journal entries. I haven't seen any of those comments in the main survey. And it's, it's an unfortunate fact of life. So, 
I don't know that I'll do more research on it, but I'll certainly share what I learn. Great. Any more comments um, from James, Allison, or even Carol before I, we end? Get out there and ride. <laughs> and thank you very much. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you to our presenters. Really appreciate it, James, Carol, and Allison. Um, there are many more questions we did not get to. So again, if you do have any follow-up questions, I encourage you to reach out to the presenters. I will share it to by tomorrow. I should be sharing uh, my follow-up email that will include a, um, the link to all the resources that you see on this slide right now. And also their names are gonna be hyperlinked to their emails. And so um, I wanna again, thank our generous sponsor of today's webinar, our Maine Recreational Trails Program Advisory Committee, as well as the additional uh, webinar partners today that include Camelot Tools, Drs. Elizabeth and Greg Berger, Poly Products, the Trail Safe Passing Plan, Stop, Speak and Stand Back, Black Diamond Trail Designs, Presto Geosystems, Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, as well as the USDA Forest Service. And we hope you'll be able to join us for next week's webinar in our Advancing Trails webinar series. It's free um, along with free learning credits and you can register for it now. And a reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash American Trails. You'll get a notification when this webinar recording is available. Um, and of course, also when we go live um, and you'll get that recording within a few hours hours. Um, so thank you again to everyone for attending. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails.